Hello friends, today in this video we will be actually looking at what technical analysis is. I know in my past videos some people have said that uh, the ultimate money formula was kind of vague, uh, it was distant, it wasn't connected to the real financial markets, but that was those actually those were four videos that I made which includes technical analysis in itself and we're gonna look at it in this video today mainly what we will be looking at is what exactly is technical analysis and how and why it works in order to understand that we need to understand the three parts of three the three parts of three is very important. And we will be breaking down the ultimate money formula as well so we could understand exactly what is technical analysis. Okay. Here's the first of the three parts of three. I just want to give you a quick introduction first before we actually move on into looking at the entire ultimate money formula as well as describing the three parts of three, which is the three basic components of market action and the three basic premises of technical analysis. These two actually are interchangeable. It doesn't really matter which comes first, this one or this one. What ultimately matters is you understand the entire idea of the three parts of three. And what is the three parts of the ultimate money formula, which we have discussed previously. Now, this time we are going to apply it to the stock market, otherwise known as shares market in other countries. The first time we looked at the ultimate money formula, we applied it only to individuals. This time, we're going to apply it to a company in the stock market. And after we have broken down the ultimate money formula into its three parts, just to give you a hint, it goes something like this. After we have broken down the ultimate money formula into its three parts, we take up now the three basic premises and the three components of market action, which contribute to the three basic premises. And then, ultimately, we will conclude with putting it together in a real market situation using what I like to call the three little piglets and the big bad wolf. Remember in ST Short Trader, we always plan to pounce. Don't just pounce, don't just buy anything, plan before you pounce. Okay. The first we look at is, of course, the ultimate money formula. I hope you remember this. In the uh, previous videos we took up, the first four videos I made, we had the cost of living and quality of life. This was because we were looking at individuals and family. Let me just write it down here. Okay, individuals or family. So cost of living, easy to compute, it's quantitative. Quality of life, very hard to compute because it's quantitative, qualitative. 
In this part, we're going to break down the ultimate money formula and use it for the company. So we can break this down, as I said, three parts of three, right? Right here where the uh, plus sign is, we have one breakdown there. And then where the equal is, equal sign is, we have another breakdown there. So what are these? The first part is the fundamentals. Some call it fundamental analysis because they're looking at a variety of fundamentals. And, uh, of course, this is important to know. Remember in uh, the individual case, we have cost of living and quality of life. It's difficult to measure because quality of life is quanti qualitative, sorry, very qualitative and difficult to measure. But in the case of a company, it's very simple. Instead of cost of living, it's cost of doing business, also known as operational cost, and ultimately profits. Remember the ultimate money formula, the businessman approach is all about profits. So what is the profitability of the corporation or company with regards to its operational cost? Are they doing good? Are they getting better? Are they just doing the same as they always have? Are they getting worse in terms of profitability? And of course, inflation, investments, their income, and the interests come into play. The second part of the ultimate money formula we can refer to as flow. Some people call this sentiment, some call this speculation, but what are the emotions and expectations that people have? And then when they back it up with money, you get flow. Changes, we mainly look at changes in price, and volume over time and this part now is technical analysis okay let me just Uh, let me not add the other letter, okay? Technical analysis. So you have fundamentals, flow, and technical analysis, which, mind you, is an equal already of the fundamentals and the flow. So let's talk a little bit about the fundamentals. Let me just clear this board. Fundamentals, let's say there are two different companies. Both have a profit of a hundred million. However, the one company has an operational cost of, let's say, one billion. There's not enough zeros here. Okay. And the others have an operational cost of, let's say, 200 million.
So obviously, this company is much more profitable and efficient compared to these guys. This is profitability and operational costs. There are many ways of measuring this. We have um, EPS is the most common, earnings per share. How much is the net income of the company after tax divided by its outstanding shares? That's EPS. And then you have ROI, return on investments. You have inventory turnover and many other measures of profitability. These all fall under fundamentals. Now, of course, everybody, let me just change the color here. Everybody who is a part or may be a part in the future of that company always have their expectations and emotions. Based on their expectations and emotions, they may buy into that company or sell out of that company and get cash. Remember, of course, these are decisions made on their own personal call for an exchange on their own individual capacities. But everybody has a different capacity. Everybody has different emotions and mostly different expectations. Now, what is the company doing with regards to inflation, investments? Investments mostly is the company's inventory are they buying more goods and keeping more goods, which, of course, they need to spend more like, um, for example, warehouse spacing. Or they might even have to pay interest, which is a minus. They're paying interest on outgoing goods. Meantime, what is their income on those items they're keeping? And selling. So, for example, a company selling washing machines or uh, air conditioners or uh, cars, even, or maybe even a construction company. If inflation is going up, chances are the central bank will increase its benchmark interest rates in order to keep up with inflation. That way, people will be less likely to spend on buying cars, durable goods like washing machines, air conditioners, and so forth. And they're also less likely to take out a loan and pay high interest rates in putting up a new house, for example, or buying new real estate. And inflation, we've talked about inflation also. It comes hand in hand with deflation. What if there are more and more companies selling the same stuff? Obviously, profits will be going down. So we look at income here. Income will now be going down. That's one form of looking at the fundamentals. So the fundamentals always have changes in them. What was today will not necessarily be tomorrow. And that especially happens when people with different expectations and emotions come into the picture. For one thing, fundamentals already go through their own changes. 
as I mentioned, like if income goes up too high, chances are inflation will go up. And with inflation going up, interest rates will go up. Likewise, it reaches a point when inflation is already at a very high rate. The interest rate is so high that it creates now deflation and the drop in economic performance. So as I said, the uh, car dealer, the home constructor, and so forth, they don't have as much sales. Naturally, their investments, their inventory should drop. We don't know how well their income will perform. It could also drop, resulting in lower GDP. Again, we're going back to the macroeconomics, right? But basically, when it comes to the stock market, what are the emotions and expectations of people? This is flow. You can also call it mainly its volume. The thing is, volume also comes under here changes, remember? volume. Anyway, one measure of flow, a very popular measure, which some consider to be a fundamental analysis part is PE ratio. Okay, what is PE ratio basically? P.E. ratio is the amount of money that people are willing to pay to buy a share that has certain earnings per share. So in short, they're buying into a company to get ownership of that company that has a certain earnings per share, anticipating in their investments anticipating income from dividends or at least holding on to a certain number of shares of a growing company. Wow, what a mess. It looks confusing. Stick with me. You may have to watch it again. Uh, this is how it works. That's why I made this formula. Ultimate money formula. Which breaks down fundamentals and flow. Things will get a lot simpler when we get into technical analysis. Okay. So basically, we, in technical analysis, we look at the changes over a period of time of prices and volume. Now, let's look at the other two parts of three, okay? Okay, so these two are interchangeable. Actually, it's not a hard rule in stone. What's really important is you understand the three parts of three. The first part is the ultimate money formula, which is fundamentals, flow, and technicals. Now, what are technicals? These two parts make up technicals. First, you have to understand that market action, what is market action? Is the changes in price and volume over a specific period of time. This creates market action. So market action 
in the basic premises of technical analysis, market action discounts everything. Whatever has to be known is already known and have already been accounted for or discounted for. I'll give you one example. If a company is rumored to be generating higher than normal profits, let's just assume like they would normally generate, um, say, $50 million every quarter, and suddenly they're estimated to be generating 80 instead of 50. This is a rumor, but somehow it's going on. And um, a lot of people, especially insiders, would know about this. Who are the insiders? Of course, officers and board of directors. Somehow, this rumor already creates price action on an upward trend. So by the time this rumor is no longer a rumor but becomes a news, and you see it in your newspaper or whatever, you might expect this to go up, but actually it does not. It goes sideways. The price of the stock just goes sideways because the rumor has already been proven true. This is what's meant by whatever has to be known is already known and has been accounted for or discounted for where here in market action which means price volume and time second premise is prices always move in trends never in straight lines prices always move in trends and i'm sure you'd notice there's always up and down movement. Despite the zigzagging pattern, it is a trend. For example, in this trend I'm drawing, it's clearly an uptrend. Even though it has a zigzag pattern of up and downs throughout the days, it is nonetheless an uptrend movement. Then finally, history tends to repeat itself. For example, if somebody bought a stock at 100 bucks and then it goes down to 80, that person might be feeling very nervous or unsettled, but is still unwilling to sell it because he or she is coming out with a loss at 80. So when the stock comes back up from 80 to 100, that person nervously decides to get out of the market. So you see here how history has been created at that price level. The same thing can work vice versa. Now at this point, I just want to tell you there is what we call a long trade and a short trade. Many of you are not familiar with the short trade, mainly because it's not very common in the stock market. And it's also definitely not available in the Philippine Stock Exchange up until today, unfortunately. Anyway, everybody's familiar with the long trade, meaning buy first and then sell a short trade meaning sell first so how does this work this has nothing to do with time frame okay a long trade meaning you're buying something because you're expecting the price will go up at which point you can sell it at a higher price later on and keep the profits. A short trade means you're borrowing something from your broker or from other traders. You're selling it at market 
keeping the cash and then later on when the prices go down you're going to buy it again and then return the stock to whoever you borrowed it from the difference is your profit which you're keeping already okay so these are the other part the other two parts of uh, parts of three market action very important to remember and the basic premises we will come back to this again now I want to very quickly show you how are prices and volume made and determined first of all you remember from our earlier topic in the ultimate money formula you have demand and supply I argue that this is not a law as many economists would call it but rather a guiding principle supply is the willingness of uh, sellers to sell so much quantity at higher prices because they make more profit right so the higher the volume the higher the price rather the more they're willing to sell higher volume on the other hand demand they're the buyers and uh, the lower the price the higher the volume is that they are willing to buy okay so demand buyers low price high volume high price low volume and the sellers high price high volume low price low volume meaning profitability okay now this is just a guiding principle it's really not a law and we're gonna see this now applied to the stock market we are looking at level 2 screen here let me just quickly show you how a level 2 screen looks like this is a Google search it's also referred to as the bid ask spread so these are images from a Google search on the bid ask spread also known as level 2 so you can see here bid buyers this is the price they are willing buyers are willing to buy and the ask is from the sellers the price that the sellers are asking uh, from potential buyers before they part with their stock in this case remember we're talking about the stock market so the ask price always goes up as we go down the column whereas the bid price goes lower and you can see that from here as well now look at the volume the volume is not always the same as you can see in real examples here volume is not linear unlike what's described by by um, you know by by economists it's not linear as economists describe it to be like this is the buyers and this is the sellers it's not linear okay as you can see in fact it has a weird 
zigzagging shape. So if there's the buyer's line, they always begin below the current market value and sometimes the quantity goes less as well the lower the prices go so this is let's just put here buyers this is a demand And then we have the sellers, and this is supply. Again, it's a zigzaggy line. It's not quite what the uh, economists would say. So, what happens here is that eventually, some people would come in, let me just put some hash lines here. Okay, eventually, remember that um, when we talked of supply and demand, where price meets is the most important part. When a transaction actually takes place between a buyer and a seller and money changes hands, this is referred to as equilibrium. Let me just put equi. There you go. This is the equilibrium point. Meaning buyers and sellers have agreed that this is the real value of a certain product. In this case, we're talking about stocks, a stock of a certain company or shares of a certain company. But I want to point out also here, which we will be looking at in future videos, especially these congestion points where there is very high quantity or volume okay where there is very high quantity or volume of buyer we will call this support because after all it is called support <laughs> and um, where there is a high quantity of seller, we call this resistance. It's referred to support and resistance basically because prices have a hard time going above resistance and below support. Because when prices get down to this low level, there's so much support here, it tends to push or elevate prices and when it reaches this high of a level again there is a lot of sellers coming in willing to sell at this price therefore pushing it down pushing the prices of the shares down okay so seller supply buyer demand support and resistance Resistance is seller supply coming in at volume, large quantities, pushing prices down, and buyer demand support is a lot of buyers coming in with so much quantities that they tend to lift prices. Remember the uh, basic supply and demand, okay? Go back to that video. If I'm not mistaken, that was in video number two. When we talked about inflation and deflation, what moves prices up and down mainly? In this case, we can see the uh, supply and demand playing a role in finding the equilibrium price, 
which is what will become the price is down on a day-to-day -day trading basis or even minute to minute or second to second we'll look into that right now okay i have here um this is a fictitious company obviously zzz company when you look at the newspapers or quotations, you would find open, high, low, and close. And you would also see volume, right? These prices make what is technical analysis. The changes, remember? The changes in prices and in volume. Now, how does this come to be? Let's say in our previous day, it was a Friday. Okay, and today we are at the market open, and the market's opening at 9 o'clock. And everything in the market is always documented very clearly. Let's say this is now 9.01. So this is a time frame of one minute passing by between 9 and 9.01. Remember that everything in the market is very clearly documented. And this here we have is a level 2 screen. Mostly you would find this depending on your broker. Though sometimes they always, they, they don't always put this there. Uh, likewise, with the exchange you're dealing with, sometimes they also don't put this there. So, this is referred to as level 2, also known as the bid and ask spread screen. So, the bid, remember, this is the buyers. And the ask, this is the sellers. How much are they willing to buy? How many shares are they willing to buy and at what price? Remember, this always goes downwards on the bid side. And on the seller side, the ask always goes higher. The last close was at $13, for example. So we can see that over the weekend, we have this many bids. At the price of twelve dollars was a hundred eleven fifty hundred fifty shares. At eleven dollars we have eight hundred shares. Ten dollars fifty cents we have a thousand shares. So on and so forth. You can see, of course, the zigzagging volume here. Okay. Likewise, here you can see the zigzagging volume. Uh, got considerably higher here than less and higher again and less these are decisions made by people on what they think the value should be now the last close was at $13 so that's the mark I made here $13 now let's just assume that on Monday morning nine o'clock the market opens these are our current bid and ask shares buyers and sellers asking prices or selling prices now <clears throat> let's assume that a few seconds passes by okay and there were no transactions yet made and suddenly a seller comes in uh, by the way these are also referred to as limit orders meaning the people who are selling or buying whatever a number of shares they are buying or selling they only want a specific price. 
So the sellers don't want to sell less than this price. Okay. And the buyer don't want to buy higher than these prices here. Now let's say a seller comes in with a market order. Market meaning he or she is willing to buy whatever price is available. Now let's say he or she wants 300 shares of ZZZ and the order came in at just after 9 but before 901 so what happens here is there are going to be three tickets the first ticket sorry let me re remove that one okay Yeah, this was 13, remember? Okay, so the first ticket comes in at $12 for 100 shares. So this is sold out. The second ticket comes in at 150 shares, 11.50. So this also gets sold out. Next ticket comes in at 11. But this time, it's only 50 shares. So this guy still has, or these people rather, not necessarily one person. 750 shares are still available at this price. 50 shares was sold here. So the volume is usually reflected as a histogram. So you can see this 50% of this, add 50% more, and you have this. Okay? Now let's say this does not normally happen, that these things don't change. These things change constantly and continuously more and more buyers and sellers come in and that creates changes in these prices but just for simplicity of our discussion let's assume there are no changes happening here except for occasional market sellers or market buyers who are in the market buying or selling based on their emotions and expectations okay now the next change that happens let's say a few more seconds pass still no transaction and suddenly now a buyer comes in and he or she buys also at market now the market available is $14 and he or she maybe has in mind um, maybe 400 shares, okay? So there's going to be another ticket here. Remember a few seconds have passed. So another ticket will be here at $14. 200 shares and because they're buying 400 shares so we have another 200 shares vertical bar here this becomes the volume don't worry if things get a bit confusing just hang on watch until the end you may have to watch it again Okay, so at 1450, this many shares. These are all referred to as ticks.
because they're based on tickets okay so this one is sold with 50 shares remaining okay now let's say a few more seconds pass and just before another <clears throat> buyer comes in a different buyer this time for 50 shares these are all just assumptions I'll show you the real of course in a while so there's the volume 50 shares and it will be at the same price because this was still available remember so now this is not anymore available this is just assuming that nothing has changed so in this one minute period these are the three different prices we can draw a straight line this is called the tick chart this is called the tick chart because we're plotting a straight line directly over the prices also I want to show you what's referred to as candlestick I'll be using blue because this is an upward candlestick so if we were to look at a one minute price the price opened at this level here it closed at this level here the highest high is exactly at this level here so we don't draw another bar up here right because this is the highest high however the lowest low obtained within this one minute period is down here so we do draw a bar down here and now we close this up sorry for the bad drawing and this becomes colored blue it can be blue it can be white it can be green as we will see later on but the reason why it is a positive candle or a bull candle is because the open was here and the close was here so the close the closing price within that one minute is higher than the open price within that one minute and the low within that one minute is down here so this has what's known as a shadow if in case it was the other way around if in case the closing price is down here and the open price is up here this would be red or black or orange as we will see in a short while so as you can see the prices are not generated automatically or by mathematics or anything the prices are made up from people's emotions and expectations based on fundamentals okay so now that we understand that it is based on fundamentals and the changes happening in the fundamentals and of course the uh, emotions and expectations of people towards those fundamentals when they act on it they create these prices let me just quickly show you this is a live price chart of Apple and let me show you the uh, one second price chart just so you could see how it works uh, 
Okay, so unfortunately I don't have the uh, one second here since this is a free version of TradingView. Anyway, you can always check out tradingview.com. It's uh, one of the most complete and best uh, trading software for technical analysis. So, what are the three little piggies? And, uh, wait, before we get into the three little piggies, let me just show you first. This is a daily chart. Remember, we took the one minute chart earlier. How a one minute chart is created. So now, let's look at the daily chart. And you can see that these are each day's open, high, low, and close. Let me zoom it in better so you can see better. The open, high, low, and close, as well as the volume that changed hands on that particular day. In this case, we're talking about the 24th of January, 2022. So this is the open down here. Let me just get my marker. For each bar, there's a significance. This is the open. This is the close. That's the high. And down here, you see this little wick sticking out. Sorry, it's shadow. This is the low. This is the lowest price reached within that day. This is the price that it opened. This is the highest it reached that day. This is the close. Likewise, if let's take another candle. This one here, for example. This is the open. This is the close. This tiny wick down here is the low. The lowest low. And this is the high. The highest price reached within that day. So you can see the candle is red. Because the close was lower in price than the open. This one is green because the close is higher than the open price. Now, these things are not random. It all makes sense. Uh, these are referred to as candlesticks. We'll be looking at candlesticks a lot in the future and about the data points I mentioned earlier about the one minute data let's try looking at a one week data here between the 17th and the 21st so let me just mark out with a line Let's just use a simple vertical line to segregate the 21st, which is a Friday. And the 17th. Well, in this case, it's the 18th because uh, this is using the universal time clock and not the U.S. close. But of course, you can always change the time. Remember, time is a very important factor as well. Let's use another line, vertical line. Let's count five days. Two, three, four, five. Although this says the 14th, let's just count five days. And if we were to use this one as our reference on the daily chart,
we can see that the open is here. Oh, sorry, it's too thick. Um, let me just delete that line first and make it thinner, darker line. Okay, we can see the open is here. The close is down here. The lowest low reach was just a tiny speck. And the highest high reach is also not quite a tiny speck. This was the highest high reach there. And this becomes the body now. And this is red. Okay, so this whole thing is red. Now, if we were to delete all the drawings that I've made and shift through from the daily, we go into a weekly chart. One week, five days. Five trading days. And there you go. You see the exact red bar that I was talking about. So this is how prices combine in different time frames to create a bigger time frame chart. So one minute added together five five one minute bars would make up uh, a five minute bar okay if you want to learn more about candlesticks you really must um, get into some books I would recommend books by Steve Neeson and even on my own website I have a book for sale I wasn't the one who made this book. Let me just quickly show you. Go into stshortrader.com Here we are. Okay, here. stshortrader.com uh, from our home page, you can just click on products and services. And you can see we have a lot of courses available as well as personalized coaching. And this is the book I'm talking about, the Candlestick Trading Bible, which definitely we will be using a lot of in the future. We'll be talking a lot of technical analysis and candlesticks. That's the reason why this particular video I'm making today is probably the most important to understand and to watch from all the previous videos I've made and even in all the videos that I will be making in the future, okay? So, finally, let's wrap up. Technical analysis is an analysis of market action, knowing that prices move in trends, never in a straight line, and history tends to repeat itself. And when we talk of market action, market action discounts everything. It's made up of price, volume, and time. And as you can see here, I have the three little piggies. Time, you can see it on the scale. Volume is on the scale in the form of vertical bars. And price on this scale here in the form of candlesticks. So as you can see, prices are continuously fluctuating up and down. They never move in a straight line. There's simply no such thing. It's always an up and down movement. However, prices move in trends. So as you can see, 
this is an uptrend. And of course, there are also downtrends. It depends on your perspective, how far away you're looking. And then you can see here also support. There is a portion of support where there was a lot of volume of people coming in to buy. At this point in time, 2020, this was when the uh, pandemic hit, some panic took over, a lot sold, but it sold. But obviously, you can see the big volume bars here, which means a lot of people bought. And it was relatively close. Not exactly at the same level, but very close to support. And we can see how volume confirms price action. As prices are going up here, you can see volume going up. As the price took a dip, volume also took a dip, which means there isn't strength in selling. So true enough, prices went up. Another way you can look at just pure candlesticks. Here you can see a dark cloud pattern which led to a short drop. Uh, some spinning tops, bullish spinning tops which went upwards. Another dark cloud pattern which led downwards. Um, Basically, how you put your whole game plan together is what we really are talking about in ST Short Trader. So I hope you do join our group, ST Short Trader. Or you can also just post comments, questions here in YouTube. But it's better, of course, if you join our group in Facebook and uh, do ask questions because the most important thing really is you're not just looking at the three little piggies here, the price, the volume, and the time. You can always come up with one or another strategy. What's important is to have a plan. You always plan before you pounce. And the important thing about having a plan is to avoid the risk, avoid the werewolf. Enjoy the three little piggies, but stay away from the werewolf. Carefully coordinate your, your capital, your risk management, how you manage your funds so that you maximize your profits and minimize losses when they do occur such that you don't get eaten up alive by the market. I hope you do enjoy this video. Watch it again if you're a bit confused. Any questions you have, please feel free to post it in our group in Facebook or to post it in the comments down below. I'll always be happy to respond to your questions, comments, and suggestions. Thank you, and remember, plan before you pounce. Bye-bye.